The Word of God says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father, from above. Let me just share a couple thoughts here with you this morning. Before the invention of electricity, candles were used to bring light to the home during the Christmas time. Candlelight was a symbol of the light of Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, which represents he's the light of our life. The first Christmas lights were introduced by a man by the name of Edward Johnson in 1882 and a friend and a partner of the lighting bulb pioneer inventor by the name of Thomas Edison in order to bring warmth into the winter time. In, 1880, in 1895, the idea of Christmas lights on a tree was adopted when President Cleveland requested hundreds of multicolored electric light bulbs for the White House family Christmas tree. In 1923, when President Calvin Coolidge started celebrating Christmas with a national Christmas tree lighting, Christmas lights officially became a holiday tradition. In modern times, hundreds of millions of, of Christmas lights sets are sold in the United States each year. Hundreds of millions of homes are decorated with those Christmas lights, making a festive time. Whether it's an incandescent Christmas light or an LED, an icicle, a retro, micro, rope, mesh, Christmas lights, projectors, candle lamps, luminaries, battery-operated Christmas lights, or Christmas night lights, we see twinkling lights adorning trees, windows, frames, doors, lawns, street lamps, roofs, in homes, everywhere celebrating the Christmas season. And sometimes you wear them around your neck with batteries attached to them and you're all lit up. Amen. <laughs> Christmas lights shine all day, but they shine most brightly at night. Just like Christ, like love, is more needed in times of testing and times of trials. As Mandino once said, I will, I will love the lights for it shows me the way. Yet I will endure the darkness for it shows me the stars. To that effect, Christmas lights also symbolizes the stars, particularly the star of David that appeared in Bethlehem the night that Christ was born. Even though the use of lit Christmas trees and Christmas lights didn't start with Christianity, there still it displays Christmas lights can remind us to follow Jesus and the path that he has provided for us in life. Christmas can be a dark time for many of us who are going through grief or the aftermath of trauma, depression, loneliness, or whatever sadness or heartbreak that we may experience in life. Having light in the form of hope and peace and joy in our lives can feel like a far-fetched desire. Many of us think of the experiences of lighting up a dark room by turning on a light switch. The room is instantly turned bright and darkness is gone in the blink of an eye. However, overcoming darkness oftentimes, it, it does not happen in a fraction of a second, but rather in a more subtle, gradual, and slow fashion, such as when the sun sets or the sun rises each day. If you're going through dark times, I encourage you to embrace the light. Embrace the light of Christmas, literally and figuratively. Let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven as you give the kindness you wish you received. I feel that serving, helping, and encouraging others can bring such, such an extreme amount of joy in a person's life. Find light through your faith, knowing that there is a purpose in your pain and that all things do work together for good to them that love God, even when we don't see it in that moment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these two fine young men are going to help me light this tree. So guys, if y'all are ready, y'all go around, take that plug and plug it in. You get it? You might have to turn it around the other way. Let's see. There you go. There you go. All right, you guys come on around the tree. Come on around the tree right here with me. Didn't they do a fantastic job this morning? 
Thank you, guys. Give me a knuckle bump. There you go. Fantastic. Today I'm completing the series that we've been on in the book of Joshua. And uh, today we're dealing with living in Canaan from Joshua 24. And I pray it will be a challenge and a blessing to your heart and your life. This has been a long study, but it has been a powerful study that has really blessed our hearts and really drew our attention to what the Lord wants us to do and how we are to live. You know, as Joshua nears the end of his earthly, his earthly life, what he's doing, he's coming before the people. He's not coming with a sob story. He's coming to challenge them. He's coming to challenge them with a single purpose, to walk before the Lord your God. I don't think there could be a better statement made for us as Christians today that we walk before the Lord our God and that we remain faithful unto Him. Listen, let me tell you something today. You cannot go today in a neutral position between following the devil and following the Lord. There is no place there where you can just be in a neutral position. You're either for God or you're against God. And so this is exactly what Jesus is telling us when he tells us in the New Testament that you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to love the one and hate the other. You can't serve God in mammon. You can't serve God in the world. You can't live today for the flesh and try to live for the Lord. You're going to, and you're going to see that Joshua really gives the defining statement today about our servitude to the Lord. There is no intermediate ground when it comes to God. There's no in-between. You're either for Him or you're against Him. And therefore today, your life must reflect as a Christian that you live what you say that you believe. The greater pearl of the Christian faith today is that you have no strength in yourself. And you can't stand by yourself through what you go through. You've got to realize today as the Word of God explicitly defines your strength comes literally out of your weakness and your sense of dependence that you have on the Lord. You realize you can't make it without Him. You can't live without Him. As a matter of fact, He becomes your life and everything about your life. The children of Israel said to Joshua, you don't know what you're talking about. And that's a paraphrase. They said, we're going to serve the Lord anyway. Were they? Did they? I'm not sure about that because if you'll step into the next book that comes after Joshua, the book of Judges, it spells their attempt to serve God in their own strength, which basically brought defeat. They tried to go through religion. It doesn't work. There are many today trying to live a religious life. Listen, friend, I know that term is synonymous in Christianity, but really, religion today is man's attempt to get to God. Redemption is God's way for us to come to Him because we're broken, shattered, and spilled out. And it's only God who can turn our lives around and change us today. It's only God that can give us purpose. There's only God today that can give us a heaven. There's only God today that can turn anything around that's wrong in your life and bring a blessing out of it. God is a holy God. But let's not forget that He is also a jealous God. And you can't put things before him. And I'm glad he's that way. I'm glad he demands our attention today. And he, today he will not put up with sin. And today he will not tolerate unfaithfulness to his kingdom. So today you say, well, that's kind of tough, isn't it, Pastor? Don't you think God has the right to be that way? Amen. With what he did for us and the price he paid for our wretchedness and our sin... And our deplorable condition where we had no hope, where we were dying and going to hell. And God sent his son and his name would be called Emmanuel, God with us. You know, for Joshua making a declaration about really, he's talking about what matters most today to him and not only to him. But let me tell you today, Christ just, just doesn't need to be just Lord of your life. He needs to be Lord of your home and your household and your family. He was not swayed by popular opinion. And he was not today captured in what we are experiencing today called political correctness. Well, there's only one correctness that I know, and that's called biblical correctness. 
And that's doing it the way God said to do it. He was not drawn by that liberal mindset today and this issue today that we face in our world called easy believism. It didn't matter to him. Joshua had a total, complete, absolute commitment to follow God regardless. Nothing was going to alter that. He was not controlled by COVID. He wasn't controlled by condition. He wasn't controlled by anything else in the world. And we shouldn't be either, shouldn't we? Today we should be controlled by Christ. He is our forefront. He is our focus. He is our life. He is our hope. He is our everything, amen. So you, you realize that. Then we come to the point that there's no turning back. There's no faltering. There's no persuasion. There's no intimidation. We today can also stand with Joshua and say, yes, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord regardless. Amen. Just not on Sunday, but every hour and every minute of the day. I want you to join me in the reading of God's word from our text found in Joshua 24. We're picking up with verse 14 and reading down through verse 24. And I pray the power today of God's word will change your life, change your heart, and change your mind. Verse 14 begins, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me, at my house, we will serve the Lord. We need that. We need that today in our spirit, don't we? We really do. And the people answered and said, listen to what they do. God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up, brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt and from the house of the of bondage and which did those great signs in our sights and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore, will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Let me tell you something. Sidebar here. Lip service is one thing. Real service is the real thing. Amen. And Joshua said unto the people, you cannot serve the Lord. For he it is holy. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you that, that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. I only wish they had done what they said. I only wish we as Christians would do what we say that we believe. I just don't take the shout out of the meeting now. Because the word of God tells us today that God, as you've just seen, is a jealous God. He's not giving you and I, who are born again believers, options of how to live our lives. He is a standard. And that standard is above the degradation of God, how he brought us out of that. It's a higher standard. As he inclined unto us and heard our cry and brought us up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set our foot upon a rock. We don't live that way anymore. We live today in the path of righteousness and holiness. We are to seek the Lord and to live for him. Joshua's right. 
We cannot today because we have not won the willpower, nor do we have the emotional strength today. We don't have today souls really for that, to live that way, but we have a God who sent his son and died for us, and our life now is anchored in Christ, and we don't live like we used to live anymore. It's God who strengthens us. And it's God today in his word that gives us insight and leadership and speaks to our heart. So this book, this Joshua, this man who was a deliverer is really pointing to a greater Joshua, a greater deliverer. He is pointing us today to Jesus And I'm glad today, Jesus, who just doesn't deliver us out of bad situations in life. Jesus is the deliverer that delivers us today from the wrath of God that was against us. And we had, we were condemned. We were bound for hell. We were in shackles. Sin controlled us. We had no freedom. We were in slavery to ourselves, to the devil, the world, and sin. But God, through his son, gave us this one that we know as we've heard sung about today, Emmanuel, and thank God that love is found in what Jesus did at the cross for you and I and the way that he made. Thank God for that. So we find something in verse 31, just stepping ahead for a moment. And it says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that over, overlived Joshua and, and which had known all the word works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. So Joshua, he's at the end of his life. He's standing before his people and he's giving them a heart-wrenching speech that would get their attention. The people are living in a place where they don't belong. See, they, sometimes we think, well, you know, I'm going to serve the Lord. And I, I'm, I, I really do love the Lord. But we stay in what we're in and we keep living like we're living. And there's no change or transformation in our life. What's wrong? Something's not right. We're still conducting ourselves like we used to be. We put on a robe of religiosity on Sunday and try to look holy and talk holy and talk Bible stuff. And then we step out into the world on Monday and we're right back into that same mess we came out of. That's not the way Christianity works. That's not the commitment that we have to the Lord. He reminds them that they're going into a land and they were in a land where they didn't belong. Now, we are pilgrims. In this land in which we live, we're strangers. We're passing through. But listen, in that place that we're at, God can still mightily speak to our hearts and gloriously use us for his kingdom. We don't have today to filter ourselves into the ways of the world. We don't have to fall into those places that we used to go and say, oh, I'm sorry, I just just got caught up in the... Oh, you just don't know. Here's our... One of our favorite friends. You just don't know what I'm going through. And by the way, Pastor, I'm doing the best I can. I even catch myself saying that sometimes. And I say, don't say that. You say, you slap yourself. Yeah, I can, but you can't. Amen. (laughs) Praise God. I say all that to say this. Living in the land that we're in is not always easy. It was not easy for the children of Israel. But you know they made decisions as we make decisions every day on how we're going to conduct our Christian life. The world is a hard place to be, but this is not finality. I've got a better place to go and a brighter day ahead. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Living as a believer and living today as a follower of Jesus today in this world, you may perceive that it is hard to do. And the world thinks your belief in Christ and the Bible and coming to church is strange. As a matter of fact, we live in a world that does not love God, nor does it love the Bible. 
It's horrendous. I'm not going to tell you the event. I was recently visiting in the hospital. And while I was there, a television was on in the room and the patient was sleeping. And I, I typically, if you're in there and if you're asleep, you know what I do? I just go in and sit down. You say, what are you doing? Listen to you snore. No, not really. Not really. Not really. I just, I'll just sit there and wait for you to wake up. Well, it was, it was a cartoon of something on the television, and the volume was on, and the person wasn't watching this, obviously. But, you know, I've never heard some, it was a cartoon, and these filthy cartoons that are out there, and I mean, and I'm not even going to say what it was about, but let me tell you what, it, it shocked my modesty. And I thought, my Lord, how horrendous, how horrible. And this stuff is being filtered into our kids, into people's lives. We live in a world today that actually makes fun of God and laughs at Christianity. A world that does not believe like you and I believe today. And today you can feel that in the culture in which we live today. It is so strong. So here's the theme, and I'm going to give you six or seven quick points. The theme goes like this. You can live with joy in a world that hates our God. And you've got to come to that point of realizing the world does not like God, does not love God, and doesn't have any association with God. But you and I who are born again, any born again people in the house shout amen. amen. You can live with joy amidst all that mess today. So what do we do? Here's seven things that you can do. One, count on grace. The word grace really ought to be the dominant theme when it comes to the understanding of our Christianity. You will save by grace. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we go back to verses 1 through 13. And here we see a continual, as we did last Sunday, a continual repeating of grace over grace over grace. Such things as God's good in his provision. And isn't he in that? Amen. God is good in his deliverance. Isn't he in that? That God is a good protector of his people, a good supplier, a good friend. He's everything. So God has dealt with his people and he dealt with his people then as he deals with people now in the grace of God. Amen. We don't get what we deserve. Somebody shout amen on that. Amen. You've got to understand that salvation is by grace. It's not joining the church. It's not being religious. It's not shaking a pastor's hand. You can even be even immersed in water and staked out in water. It's not going to save you. What saves you is the royal crimson blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only means of salvation. Apart from that, there is no salvation. And that's what Christ is speaking through grace to you and I today. So therefore... Let me tell you, if you don't get sovereign grace and salvation grace right, you can't get Christianity right. Amen. You need to get a full grasp on how God saved us. And let me tell you, when he saves you, you are not the same anymore. You are tra changed or transformed. You didn't take the first step because you know what? Dead men don't walk. He took the step towards us. I've heard people say, I found the Lord. Oh, really? Was he lost? No, he found us. We were lost. It was God who spoke. It was God who called you out of sin, shame, and deadness, and brought you into life. God gave you life. That resurrection power of life is only found in Jesus Christ today. If you don't get grace right, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to fall into legalism and you're going to presume on the grace of God. But we need to count on God's grace that was given to us at the cross by His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God saved you by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. That's the only way it works. The image of, uh, the image of God in you today is dis disfigured. By the degradation of our sin. Sin has broken today our nature. And we're dead in sin. But praise God. We're saved by the blood of Jesus. And our life changes. Therefore if any man or person be in Christ. 
They are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Jesus, you don't have to walk in guilt and shame any longer today because now you are no longer in condemnation. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Second, remember, God is God. You're not God. And let me tell you what. Our government sure isn't God. Amen. Joshua said, fear God. Stand in awe of the awesomeness of our God. Oh, I'll tell you, when you do what it says in Hebrews 4, 16, come boldly unto the throne of grace, you will stand in awe of him. Amen. When he's brought you out of a trial or through some sickness or helped you in some particular way, you'll see how awesome he is. But you know, it just doesn't take those instances to us to understand the awesomeness, awesomeness of our God. When you read the story about how God sent his son, born of a virgin, and there in a lowly cattle stall to make a means of salvation for you and I, you'll stand in the awe of God. When you read about, and then the angel of the Lord spoke, and the shepherds were filled with fear. And the angel said, fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy. Oh, you know, those words are still reverberating today, but they're not so much in the atmosphere. They are reverberating within our soul and our spirit that we don't have to have a fearful heart anymore. We've been redeemed by the God of heaven. And today we have reason to rejoice in our God today because, listen, we've been saved by his grace. And today we realize he is such an awesome, almighty, glorious, and good God. Amen. That's him. Amen. When you fear God, when you fear God, there are things that you will not do. And there are lines that you won't cross because of the cross. Amen. You no longer feel comfortable in doing sin in your life. Fearing God will make you careful. And let me tell you this. The fear of God, I look at it this way. It's a preventative medicine. It'll keep you out of the mire of sin. It'll keep you out of the thoughts of sin. It'll keep you out of even the defeats of sin. And that's what today God will do. If, if more Christians fear God, then I believe more Christians would be faithful to God's house. Amen. Amen. I'm sure every one of you sitting in this congregation today could probably think of a reason why it had been nice to stay home in bed this morning. You don't lie to me. You know you would. Amen. Yeah. Wouldn't have to get up and take a shower and bathe and shave and put on clothes and go to church and you could be doing something else. But thank God you made the right choice. But let me tell you what. Grace made that available that you could be here. And we need a, I'm telling you today, Christians need to start getting a priority of God, his house in, in prayer and the word in their life. Amen. Amen. We fear God and nothing else. Third, they're going to get quicker as we go. <laughs> Take joy in serving. Serving God is not a drudgery. I didn't get up this morning and say, oh man. I got to go preach two messages and man, I got to do all this Christmas stuff and all that. No, let me tell you what. I thank God that I had the privilege of being here today. I'm glad he spared me another day that I could be here to celebrate him today. Amen. Amen. Thank God. See, there's joy in serving. 16 times in this passage, Joshua says, serve the Lord. Do you think he's trying to make a point? I do. Serving God is not an occasional or Sunday thing. It's an everyday living thing. And that's the way we should live. To serve the Lord is a total devotion to the Lord. It's completely selling out to Him. We live out what we say that we believe. And if you're not living out what you're saying that you believe, you never believed it to begin with. Amen. So we serve the Lord in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it's good, whether it's bad, regardless of today, we today are governed by the truth of the grace of God. So it's important that we get doctrinal truth right. There's a lot of 
doctrines that's floating around in churches today that doesn't have any basis on the Bible, none whatsoever. And in this world, let me tell you, all this mess about gender confusion, the Bible defines what it means to be a man. And even science agrees and medicine agrees with that because you can read through every medical book there is and you can't find any place that you can change your body parts that it will make you a woman or make you a man. You came in and genetically and in your DNA and every part of you and every molecule in your body, if you are a man or a male, that's what you are. And if you are a female, then that's what you are. Well, thank God for it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We need, biblical, we need biblical doctrine to invade our devotion. And doctrine informs today devotion, and devotion is displayed in our everyday living for the Lord. This is how you take joy in serving today. This is what Paul said, for me to live, it's Christ. Fourth, throw away your idols. Preacher, I don't have no idols, no Shinto shrines, no wooden idols. I don't have none of that. I don't have nothing set up. I don't bow to those things. Yeah, you, I'm glad you don't. But what is standing between you and God? Because anything standing between you and your service and your commitment to God is an idol. It's something that you've replaced God with. We come up with things to worship. I mean, honestly, maybe we haven't worshipped COVID, but we sure have used that as an excuse not to serve God, haven't we? Amen. We need to put away the gods today. Those things that draw really our attention and our strength away from us. You need genuine repentance and change and you need God in your life every day. And the radical evidence of conversion is the pearl of great price and his name is Jesus Christ. You need that in your living today. You must get idols out of your life. You've got to remove anything. If you're driven by idols, it's time today you to say, Lord, I'm not going to be driven by that anymore. Bring it to an altar and say, Lord, take those things out of my life. Whatever is keeping me from serving you, get it out of the way. Amen. Nothing today can be in the way of worshiping God. Fifth, you've got to make a commitment. Verse 15, Joshua proclaims, choose this day whom you will serve. Hmm. Then he comes right behind that and says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Is that your life today? Choosing to serve the Lord is a matter of commitment, isn't it? It's a matter of our loyalty to the God. So therefore, do you understand the gravity today to make such a commitment to God? And let me tell you, if you make that commitment, he expects you to keep that commitment. I don't know how I can do it. By the strength of the Lord in your life is how you do it. Amen. Have we counted the cost that was paid for our salvation? Have you really today? You can't talk about Christmas without talking about Easter. Or you can't talk about Easter without talking about Christmas. They're intertwined. It all provides for us a way where Emmanuel would come and be with us and change our lives and be our God. And Jesus would redeem our souls. We don't need easy believism. We today don't need this this idea today of what the world is embracing, we need today a genuine, sold-out commitment to the Lord and Him first, F-I-R-S-T. And wearing a Jesus first lapel pin doesn't make Jesus first in your life. I'm not against that. I think it's great. But I'm going to tell you what makes Jesus first is when you surrender your all to His leadership in your life. Amen. Six, live as an example. You don't have to wear things to identify you as being with Jesus. Your life is the best identifier that you've got. So can you say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? You know, folks, is that your example today of what's going on in your life? You need to take Joshua 24, 14 off of the wall and get it in your heart. We may have all these slogans and Scriptures and things posted on the walls of our home, but it's no good except just to make people think when they come into your home, they must be a Christian or something. Amen. Well, that's well and good, but let me tell you what, is a better representation of your Christianity. Have you got, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord in your life every day. Are you serving him today? And lastly, discipline your heart. Joshua said in verse 23, Incline your heart, incline your heart to the Lord. The Bible declares 
we have a will, we have a mind to drive our hearts. And today, that driven in our life is to drive us to that which is good and holy. It's not the pronouncement of what you say. It is the declaration of what you live. So you must discipline your heart to live a life for God. Are you the same person out there in work and in home and in society and shopping and everything else? We're, getting, we're coming on a season right now where the worst of you is going to probably come out. Yeah. That's why I don't go to Black Fridays or crazy shopping centers and all that. I'm telling you right now, people turn into maniacs. You put a shopping cart and there's only two turkeys left in the bin and there's three of you, it turns into a maniac occurrence, amen. Or whatever that product is on that table that you're trying to get to and you don't care, man, you'll knock granny down and walk over top of her to get to it, whatever it takes, amen. I mean, it's fair game, right? No, it's not. What you're living, listen, if that's a downfall for you and not to mention, People driving cars. I had to go down last night to put some programs on. Where in the world is people going at 1030 at night in such a hurry? Would you tell me that they've got to ride your bumper and try to push you down the highway? Back off, dude. Amen. But people go nuts. Crazy. We live in a world that hates God. They hate the God of the Bible. They hate the God of salvation. But God wants us to live in this world with joy and strength, not with bitterness and not in rage and not in all the other things that people are filling their lives with right now. Man, live today in the joy and the strength of the Lord. For Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength, amen. Learn to live for God. Learn to set out to Him. Learn to keep Him first. And learn today to have joy unspeakable and full of glory in your life. As I close, listen. So the question that I'm following to you, given in your presence today, is simply this. So what have you done with Jesus, friend? What have you done with him today? Do you fear, reverence, respect God? Or is he just the name that you use? Is it God that you're serving? Is it God that has your attention? And I'm going to tell you, if he doesn't, He's got ways to get it. I'm not preaching fear. I'm preaching fact. He's a jealous God. And he's not going to tolerate you laying down your faithfulness and your testimony to appease somebody's pressure to cause you to do something that you have no business doing. How will you serve God this week? What's going to be the testimony of your life? How are you going to seek to bless somebody this week? And you can. There are people that need your encouragement. There are people that need your blessing. There are people that need your prayers. How are you going to encourage them? And how are you going to encourage them not only now, but even during a holy season? No, it's not the holiday season. It's a holy season. Amen. Amen. It's today about committing ourselves to the Lord. So I close with this, and this is what you've got to decide. One, you've got to choose this day whom you're going to serve. And you've got to, not by the pronouncement of your mouth, but by the proclamation of your life, you've got to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. If you've got struggles today and problems and pains and difficulties in your life, Anybody got some stuff going on in your life that you need prayer for today? Throw your hand up. I need prayer, Pastor. Uh, uh, either me or my family or things that are going on in life. I just need prayer. I need healing. I need help. I need strength. I need encouragement. I need joy. We all do, don't we? So if you didn't raise your hand, I just raised it for you. But it's all found at Jesus and in Jesus at the altars. Here's a place that you can come and cast your every care upon him.
where he cares for you. This is where you can come. And today, if you've got sin in your life and you're not saved, this is where you can come and be saved. And if you need salvation, I'll be down front. You come and say, Preacher, I need to be saved. I'll be more than honored to pray with you and show you how you can be saved. Or if you've got things, sickness or trials or difficulties or family needs or burdens in your life or friends or people you know that needs encouragement, bring it to the Lord. 